Well, good morning, and, and thanks again for the, the opportunity to come up. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure for me to, to visit with your group and look forward to the next couple of days, uh, the conversation in the halls and the questions that you have, uh, anything that, that we can uh, do to, to help you uh, better understand these tools and the opportunities that they provide and those sort of things, Michelle and I and are here to, to help you with that. So, you know, this, this session is going to focus on the Angus uh, GS assay, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of the background and the history of, of how it was developed. Uh, Michelle's going to get into more of the details and, and, and their partnership with Neogen and some of that, and then we'll, we'll go on and, and talk a little bit kind of to wrap up about how it's, it's being implemented around the world. So, uh, you know, genomics, uh, and, and I'm not going to go into a great deal on the evaluation. We did a little bit of that in the last session talking about the single step evaluation and how genomics helps us better evaluate cattle because it, it gives them a, a more accurate pedigree. It, it under it, describes accurately which ancestors are making bigger contributions into individual animals, which ones are more influential. When you, when you look at, at, at an individual bull on paper, on the registration certificate, you see halves and quarters and eighths as you go back in that pedigree. But genomics tells us it's not balanced like that, that, that certain animals are getting bigger contributions from certain ancestors and traits are coming along with it. That's why when you see flush mates or when you see three-quarter sibs, they can be actually quite different in terms of their makeup. And so, you know, for our breeders and for more and more of your breeders all the time, genomic testing has become a really a standard operating procedure to, to describe those animals. It's not a, it's not a, a something to dip their toe in the, in the water anymore and, and see what it does. It's something that, that very much is, is a key part of their data collection efforts along with weights and measures and ultrasound and, and all those sort of things. And that the reason we're doing is that it's adding a significant a, a increase in accuracy, on, on particularly on young animals, that, that a, a yearling bull can have the kind of EPD accuracy as an untested bull that might have 20 progeny for some of those traits. And so for your bull customers, there's real value there. And also for traits that are not frequently recorded. For example, we're characterizing at a high degree of, of accuracy for feed intake. And most of us don't have the facilities and the ability to measure feed intake uh, in, our, in our growing bulls. But there are operations that do, and they measure those animals, and then we can use genomics and, and understand the relationships between high and, and low intake animals and, and better characterize feed efficiency in Angus cattle. And, and we'll continue to, to have more and more traits where that's the case. You know, this, this genomics area has come a long way and really not that long since Angus launched, American Angus launched genomically enhanced EPDs back in 2012 that we, we see now a tenfold increase in our annual testing volume. That, that first year uh, we did about 10, 11,000 or something like that. We're doing, combined with, with, uh, with U.S. and Canada, we're doing somewhere in the order of 140 to 150,000 animals that are being genotyped now on an annual basis. We're, on our side, uh, more than half of the young animals that are being registered each year uh, are being DNA tested. And that, that's a big growth. And so that's, that's, I never would have imagined that. If you'd have told me when I was finishing my, my PhD 20 years ago that we'd be doing that, I'd told you you're out of your mind. There's just no possible way we'd be DNA testing cattle uniquely. But, but a lot has changed. The technology has changed. The cost has come down. Those first 50 Ks cost $159. Uh, and, and so part of the reason is, you know, that, that now where we're at at a pricing point is a lot more favorable. Uh, and that, that's true of everything. I, I once bought a VCR and paid $400 for it. Uh, so you, you, some of you have too. So you understand how those things change with technology over time. And the younger people are saying, what's a VCR? <laughs> you tell them later, okay? And it's the same way in the assays, you know, that, for example, the chips that go into the machines that this, this original bovine 50K, that's eight animals on a, on a slide, which is pretty amazing because that thing's about like a business card cut in half uh, the long way. Uh, but this one, new one over that we're using now, does 96 uh, on the same kind of a footprint. Now, that we didn't cut the cost by, by 196 because this chip costs a whole lot more than that one did, but it can do so much more. And so there's real efficiency in, on Michelle's side of the business, uh, as well as what we're able to do when, when those results come back to us at AGI and putting them into the evaluation. We're much better at, at characterizing animals based on that. We know a lot more about how to use that information as accurately as possible. This kind of shows you just kind of the growth. And so this is, this is American Angus, Canadian Angus combined in the AGI weekly, monthly, in your case, genetic evaluation. 
but to see how year over year how that's growing. And so we're now at uh, the, this month, you're about to release a new monthly evaluation for, for June, and that'll include six, over 650,000 animals that have, that have genotypes in there. You know, we're not Holstein. They, they're, they're at 2 million plus or something like that. But, uh, but we're a whole lot more than anybody else, really, in terms of that. And so that's something that's really taken off uh, everywhere. So the story of Angus GS is actually very much a Canadian story, Michelle, right? That uh, two folks that, that have both happen to be U.S. Re residents but Canadian-born. And, and uh, Stuart Bach, who's the vice president of Neogen, uh, you know, that has come up and, and one of the real pioneers in this business from his time uh, with, uh, with Marielle and then as, as that uh, morphed into GeneSeq and now part of Neogen. But, but Dr. Bach is, is uh, he, we talked a little bit before this and he was, really jealous that he would love to come up. He had some other conflicts that he had to deal with, but he, he was actually a practicing veterinarian in this part of Alberta for a period of time when he first got out of vet school. And so he's, he knows this country much better than I ever will. Uh, but back in 2016 at our Angus convention, uh, while some of the, the political meetings and things were going off, a couple, of, Stuart was back in the trade show with Steve Miller. And Steve, some of you may, may know Dr. Miller that, that I was lucky enough to attract to my team. He's a native of Ontario and has all his degrees from Guelph. So, so Dr. Miller is, is from Ontario and uh, he was in New Zealand uh, working for ag research there after a, a number of years at the University of Guelph. And he's part of our team. And those, those guys got together uh, during the Angus Convention, just had a casual conversation. And Stuart said, you know, this, this technology is, is moving and your volume is growing. You are to the point now, which, which really surprised me, he said you are to the point now where you can build a custom chip. Now we had always had some custom content, but the idea that he said, you know, you, you guys, when you're doing 100,000 a year, you can, you can now build your own. Now, again, that was not even five years ago. You know, the, there, there's a, there was a bovine chip. I love how the uh, batteries died in the technology talk. That's the best. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to, um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michelle Miller. I am the GM of Now Neogen Canada. Um, uh, last December, I was the CEO of Delta Genomics, and uh, Neogen purchased uh, the assets and business of Delta Genomics on January 1 of this year. Um, so you've probably noticed on your forms that you send in, there's a different logo on the top. And uh, so far, that's, that's pretty much the biggest change. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about this partnership that Dan has uh, described and kind of described where, where the Angus GS um, technology has come from. Um, and we're, we're very much proud to partner with uh, AGI. Um, and one of the neat things about this is that um, Angus, the Angus GS chip, we, it's available worldwide. And so right now, um, Australia, Argentina, and Canada are all the countries outside of the U.S. actually using this chip. And so Neogen has six, six genomics labs worldwide um, in five different continents. And so we're hoping that anywhere that Angus cattle are raised, they'll have access to this Angus GS chip. Um, and like Dan talked about uh, in the previous session, the evaluation with um, Australia, for example, we're probably not going to a global evaluation. Um, that probably doesn't make sense. Maybe 10 or 12 steps down the road it will. Um, but for right now, it, it very much makes sense to have a North American evaluation. And so the fact that we're using the same foundational technology for all of this, um, I think really speaks to um, what we're building for Angus um, and to have uh, Angus researchers and Angus scientists leading that charge, I think speaks a lot to this partnership. Um, so in this partnership, it's really about synergy. Um, what Angus brings to the table is the, the database and the data and the understanding um, and everything Angus specific, um, all that Angus data. What Neogen brings to the partnership, we know how to genotype things. Um, last year, we genotyped 3.4 million samples through the facility in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and that doesn't include the other five facilities worldwide as well. So. So we, we're very good at genotyping, Angus is very good at Angus. And so I think that synergy puts together a really powerful technology for you guys to use in your, in your operations. Um, so at Neogen, uh, we have three pillars really of success that are the foundation of what we do. Uh, the first is high quality data. And so in Lincoln, uh, Nebraska, 
uh, they actually bought the auto body shop next door to the lab and refurbished it into a cubicle farm. And just it's a, just a great big place of happy computer nerds. Um, and these people love their data. <laughs> um, so so um, every day, they do the quality controls and generate about 250 million genotypes um, from all the facilities worldwide. And that works out to about 7 billion genotypes every month. Um, so we're doing a lot, of, a lot of data, and we have a lot of quality and metrics behind it so that you guys are getting the best data. The other pillar is turnaround time. And I will be the first to admit that immediately after the acquisition in January, we struggled on that. Um, if you want to come see, we have a chart at our, our booth in the trade show, and we can show you where our turnaround times are, and we can also show you that we're back on track now um, to get those 21 days uh, turned around for you. And fair pricing. Um, technology has to be affordable. Um, it has to be affordable on a commercial scale. We can't be paying 159 US dollars on every little calf that's born. Um, and so we've, we've gotten it down to a price that uh, makes sense on both the cost side um, and also on the commercial side. And so, so Neogen backs all this, but really what it comes down to is that Angus has provided a tool for you guys to use um, that is more powerful, more accurate, and has more value because it's so Angus specific. Um, and it is just for Angus. And um, it's really neat to see how you know, 40% of the Angus GS tests that are being done in the US right now are being done on heifer calves. And it really speaks to the fact that this is a tool for you guys to use for investing in your operations. Those replacement heifers, those are an investment. Um, and you want to make sure that you're getting those heifers uh, the best heifers for your operation and for your goals. Um, and so you, you can see that uh, when they're young calves. And as Dan said in the last session, to measure the performance of a, of a cow takes years, just because she can't have as many calves as those bulls do. And so the pillars of success for, for Angus, really, in developing this technology have been the single step evaluation, which was talked about on the Angus One talk last time. Um, and it's got a lot of advantages over the previous methods. The Angus GS technology, or bead chip, um, the fact that it's ubiquitous across, across the world right now even, um, but definitely across North America. And so using that same foundational technology. Um, and also the producer data collection. And so we talked about this in the last session as well, um, about producer data. And genomics, the power of genomics, cannot be realized without the data behind it. Um, so we do really need that data. Um, and so when you collect data and you submit data, you're not just doing it for the breed. I would challenge you guys to do it for you as well. So look at your data. You know, Is it actually what you want to see? And even look at that data every once in a while. Is that data matching up with the expectations that your genetic testing is setting for you in the beginning? And so I would really challenge you to do that and have and you know use that data not only to help the breed across North America, but also to help your own operations as well. And so the, the technology, the Angus GS chip, um, this is really about, it's the first genomic profile that was developed only for Angus. And so um, speaking again to the partnership that we have with AGI, um, you know, we built something, Angus built this chip for you guys, and it's for, for Angus members. Um, so this is getting to, oh, they skipped one. That's okay. I like this chart better. Um, so when it comes to using genomic tools, um, I think anyone who's listened to me talk about DNA before, um, I've given the, the EPD and the GEPD uh, talk. But um, what's really neat is we've been able to measure the genetic gain that we can get through using genomically enhanced EPDs. So, I mean, if we look, the type's too small, but if we look at here, so if you just use the EPDs, no, no genetic testing, um, on the sire and the dam, you can get genetic gain around 32%. And so you can increase your genetics about 32% in the direction you're looking to go. When we add the sired genomics, we can increase that to the mid-30s, 
But when we add the sire and the dam genomics, we can get that close to 45%. And so we see that rapid increase in genetic gain. Um, and that genetic gain is your decision. It's based on the traits that you're interested in. Um, and so if you're really interested in weaning weight and birth weight, um, those types of things, or if you're more interested on the production side or on the carcass side, um, genetic gain is based on your goals, um, not necessarily anyone else's. And so we have this tool now, um, the little quote from Dan up there, it's cut off. Um, but really, genomics has huge potential, and as Dan mentioned, genomics is becoming a standard procedure in livestock production, not just in beef, but also in swine and dairy, um, goats and sheep. And so we've got a really, really interesting future ahead of us with genomics and the continuous improvements. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about what the, uh, what the Angus GS chip actually is. Dan showed you a picture of it. It is literally a little piece, like half a business card. Um, and this, at its base level, um, it has the parentage SNPs and the ones that are in, uh, recognized across North America. So the USDA has defined certain SNPs and markers that are good for parentage. Those are on there. ISAG, the International Standard for Animal Genetics, has also defined some parentage markers, and those are on there as well. And this is really kind of the base level, so you do need to still get your parentage out of here, and we are still working with um, all of the preset parentage markers. But what's been really neat about the Angus GS is that they haven't just put the markers that we already know about on there. And so, and so what I mean by that is, when research identifies a marker, it's usually in the form of, oh, this one might be interesting, or this region might be interesting. And so we've taken those regions and markers as well, and we've put them on there for future use. And so this is a very proactive approach and a really proactive strategy um, I found when I learned about this, in that you know, we've got a lot of potential here. So animals that have been genotyped in the past they still have that information. And so when the researchers go out and figure out what those new markers and what those interesting traits mean, then we can apply that to those animals that have already been done. And we can get continuous improvement that way um, for those animals. And this really eliminates the requirement for any retesting because nobody wants to retest. So, so I, I really do appreciate um, the, uh, the proactive approach and strategy that's been taken into developing the content for the Angus GS. Um, some of those uh, sort of traits that have been looked at as interesting, but we're not really sure and we haven't really figured out yet, are things like how the environment interacts with genetics. Um, so that's, I hear that a lot, you know, how do you compare animals raised in northern Alberta to animals raised on the Gulf of Texas? It's really hard. Um, and there's probably different traits and different attributes that the producers in those two areas are looking for. But if we can better understand how the environment and how the climate change um, interacts with the genetics of our animals, then we can better suit, we can better plan our operations to match your environment. <clears throat> and then there are also health traits. Um, and also, a, a huge one that's been coming out recently and is really popular with researchers right now is um, forage tolerance and grazing and plants and you know, what they eat. And so if we can better understand the uh, interaction between what the animals eat and their genetics, then we can have a better understanding of how to, how to manage those as well. So one of the examples that Dan mentioned was feed efficiency. And so we actually, we've, there are some markers we understand for feed efficiency in the DNA, so those are definitely on there. But there's also some markers that researchers have said, this one might be interesting, that one might be interesting. Um, and we've put those on there too, so that once the researchers figure it out, we'll be able to provide a better, more accurate feed efficiency prediction um, and on the animals that have already been tested as well. And so the other one is tenderness. And so the standard tenderness markers that we use are, are there. But there's also 500 markers from, a very, from various regions. And actually, a lot of this research is coming out of the University of Guelph um, by Dr. Angela Canovas, who actually took over for Steve Miller when he left for New Zealand. And so there's a lot of research going on right now in tenderness. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how many of these markers can we pull from this pool of 
right now interesting into we're going to use these now because we understand them. And I think that's one of the one of the really neat things. Of, <coughs> excuse me. One of the really neat things about the Angus GS is that you know we have taken this. Um, proactive approach to making sure that you know we can include everything we understand and everything we think we're going to understand. Now that doesn't include everything, but uh, I think we've got a really good start. Um, and this slide is just to say that all this content that we've added, both understanding the markers already and the stuff that we don't quite understand yet, it's all been looked at in Angus. So it is Angus specific um, for the breed. And so this little chart, what it shows is in the original evaluation for beef cattle, there's about 40,000 markers that were used. And this shows a picture of the cattle genome. Each one of those little blue or red ticks is one marker. And you can see that in some of these cases, there's some pretty big holes. Um, and so there was, there was no SNPs in that region. What Angus GS did through the partnership with AGI is we filled, those, we filled those holes in. And so now the evaluation has markers in this little empty box and this little empty box, um, as well as in some of the smaller empty spots as well. And so we have this, this higher density, um, but we also looked at a thing called minor allele frequency. And I'm getting real scientific right now. If you want to know more about it, come find me later and I'll draw some pictures on a napkin and we can <laughs> I'll make it make sense a little more. But basically what minor allele frequency means is variation. So every SNP has a metric, this MAF metric, and the higher it is, the more variation there is. And so these black lines here show the current Angus GS um, SNPs and their minor allele frequencies. And so you can see that they're quite variable compared to the original cattle evaluation. More variation gives us more information so we can do more with it. So um, variation in minor allele frequency, the higher is better. And so you can see that across the board and across the genome, it's higher. Um, and so by adding these Angus SNPs and filling in those holes, we've also increased the density of the SNPs. And this has been really important for, um, for the researchers. And actually, researchers do use Angus GS as a tool um, in their research. But things like fertility traits um, are incredibly difficult to figure out. And so this density and having more and more of those holes filled on that DNA uh, really helps us with that. And so through this process of continuous innovation and looking forward, we, we also have this process of continuous improvement. And so this is, this is the process, uh, if we go clockwise. Um, when, and we do this about every 18 months to two years, Dan? Yeah. Um, so in the, in the beginning, we said, when Stuart and Steve said, let's build an Angus chip, the very first step, build a better SNP set. And that better was based on the original Illumina 50K. So we genotyped those animals. And like Dan said, my number's a little low here, but it's probably closer to 140,000 per year going through, getting genotyped. We look at the data, and then we bring in other intel. And that includes the phenotypic data that you all submit for your EPDs. And that includes what the researchers are doing. And we combine all that information. And so when we learn from that, we can start again, and we can build a better SNP list. And we can keep going so that the Angus, the Angus GS chip continues to improve um, so that we can, we can keep up with the traits and keep adding traits that are of interest to you guys. And so with that, I'll turn it back to Dan. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. I will be around uh, till tomorrow evening. So if you have any questions about the DNA or genetics, please let me know. Thanks, Michelle. You did a, did a great job of, of going through that. I appreciate you, you helping us with the presentation. I'll just talk a little bit about some of the things that we have in the future. As, as Michelle said, you know, th this is an, there's iteration to this, that, that, that we've, a, as an organization, as AGI, American Angus, Canadian Angus, that sort of thing, we've, we're in the research business now. Uh, no doubt about it, that, that, that you know, the old model that, that we would rely on, on universities and government, and those are very important contributors. They still are and they always will be. But 
I know in your country, like in our country, the budgets are squeezed. They're, they're not able to do some of the things that, that, that they were once able to do. It's, the resources just aren't there. I started this with, with the baseball quote, which is ridiculous because everybody knows this is a basketball country right here. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but that's from an old baseball movie, If You Build It, They Will Come, right, from Field of Dreams. But th that's kind of the way we, we, we approached, uh, you know, Angus GS, you know, that, you know, if we do this, will, will people, are people interested in this? And we, we very much find that they are. And, and it has become now the leading uh, genotyping platform for Angus all over the world. And, and it's easily the, the largest but beef cattle research project ever, in, in the way I think about it. Because the way a lot of the, the government, USDA or, or, or Canada, Genome Canada, uh, universities all over the globe, you know, they'll, they'll have, a, you know, they'll do 500 animals or they'll do a thousand animals and they'll measure them for things and they'll look at their markers and something looks looks exciting that stuff gets published we put it on angus gs and then we do a hundred thousand in a year we're close to a hundred thousand in a year you know and then we, and we combine that with nine million weaning weights you know that that there's not uh, another entity that can that can do that certainly with angus cattle and so so for that, you know, th that's this, this sort of cycle of innovation. So then we analyze these new things. Some of those don't pan out, no doubt about it. There's things that, that we put on the first Angus GS that, nah, that didn't work. It didn't cost you any more to do it. We put it on there. We had plenty of room to put those things on. We got the things we knew that worked, that we needed. We got those on there. And then we had some space for some, for some, for some fun stuff, for some research things that, that have a lot of promise. Some of those work out, some of them don't. But we do that, and then another 18 months, we do it again. We evaluate what we put on, we go to the literature, we talk to people, we find out what else is going on, and we say, oh, there's some new things. Let's put those on, let's try those on 100,000 and see what those tell us about that and build that. And so, you know, right now we're studying, for example, things related to embryonic survival. You know, don't raise your hand, but anybody ever had a 60-day-old bread cow come open? Yep, yep, it happens. It happens, it happens in Angus, it happens in Hereford, it happens in Holstein happens in humans, happens in everything, okay? There's a reason for that, okay? There, there are some embryonic things, some, some more or less lethal genes that are out there in every species. Dairy cattle characterize those. If you're a Holstein breeder, if you're a brown Swiss breeder, if you're a, a Jersey breeder or an Ayrshire breeder, you can find those, and we're gonna find those too. And we're gonna find those, and so we're gonna help you make matings that will ultimately result in a higher conception rate. You and your bull customer are going to see a higher conception rate in the end because we're going to account for some of these things that nature gave us, you know, centuries ago, and, and we're going to discover those. And, you know, and it's part of the advantage that you see in crossbreeding for fertility is because of these things. Because every breed has them, but different breeds have different ones. And so when you're crossing, you're never lining up common things. Within breeds, you see them. And so we're going to be able to ultimately breed Angus cattle that are very close to as fertile as, as, as crossbred cattle, but through these sort of techniques. That, that's the kind of thing that the future holds with the same kind of growth and product quality and all the other great things and maternal ability that Angus cattle do uh, so very well. So that, that's, that's, that's coming. That's coming. And, and it very much is a, a global exercise that, that, that we've always felt like that, that we're, we're stronger together, that that the more data we can capture on lots of bloodlines of Angus cattle from here to where I come from, to Australia, to Argentina, uh, but we're having, con we've, we've tested cattle from Portugal, Angus cattle from Portugal, which are mostly UK genetics, and we've had conversations with UK about doing it, that, but right now, American Angus, Canadian Angus, Angus Australia, and Angus Argentina are all using this one, and so we're characterizing a broader uh, sort of subset of, of Angus cattle, and that'll be beneficial to us in, in the future. A question? You know, when you're comparing those cattle from like the UK to North America, and they're quite different genetic makeup. Yeah, the, the question was about, you know, looking at, at the different populations. The UK are the most different. You know, they're using less North American genetics, or at least more, less current day. They, they have a very different grading system. Those of you that aren't familiar with with the way beef is graded in the UK, it is, it is red meat yield, period. You know, there's no incentive for quality. Marbling isn't really on their radar screen. 
you know, a, a Belgian blue grades better than an Angus in a, U, in a UK grading system. So they have a whole different market that they're trying to breed to. You know, some of the, some of the variation is, has been preserved all the way back to the, you know, the, the herd book in Edinburgh, uh, but yet every generation there's new uh, variation that's built in. And, and some of those things are good and some of those things are bad and, and we continue to track those. You know, we find better, you know, we understand better the relationship. Obviously, the, the U.S. and Canada are more closely aligned than, than the U.K. The U.K. is literally kind of out on an island in terms of Angus genetics, right? They're, they're a little bit different. Australia aligns more closely with North America. Um, Argentina aligns um, with North America and actually quite heavily with Canada because, as you know, there's a lot of Canadian influence in, in Argentina genetics. And so th there's, there's more similarity than, than you might really expect, and, and, uh, but there, there are unique things that we can learn and, and unique things that we can gather from, from this sort of a global approach. You know, we can no longer be confident that the best bull in the world is born in our country. And, and having the data to, to document that the bull that might be perfect for Alberta might be born in, in New South Wales. And the bull that's perfect for New South Wales might be born in Alberta. And, and so as we work together on those, we'll be able, to, I think, to facilitate a, a better exchange and all, and all benefit from that. So no, I think that's, that's an interesting point. The, the other thing that, that you know, we're really benefiting and leveraging the, the folks at Neogen, you know, she talked about however many millions of genotypes those aren't all Angus cattle. In fact, they're not all cattle. You know, but there's an efficiency of scale because, Nia, for example, Neogen in Nebraska, they do a ton of hog samples. They do a ton of dog samples. Uh, they do genotyping of, uh, they do fish. They do all, you know, th these technologies are being used everywhere. You know, if, if you're if you're raising barley or wheat or rye, you've seen the benefit from the similar sign of technology and how the, how the genetic advancement there has happened there too. So it's the same sort of thing, but we really benefit from their scientific expertise, their volume in terms of getting samples because they can have better equipment. Um, if you ever, you know, the things that robotics are starting to play a role in some of these things in terms of being able to improve the efficiency and turnaround and accuracy and things. So there's, there's a lot happening on this front where we've, we've done some really neat things, but I think the, the big things are yet to come in terms of what we'll able, be able to do in terms of, of characterizing Angus cattle. And I think it really is an, an Angus advantage globally because we have the critical mass to do things that maybe some other breeds wish they could do. So, so we really appreciate the partnership with Canadian Angus, American Angus, other members of the Secretariat, certainly Neogen as well, in terms of, of working together to, to continue to, to drive this, this technology forward ultimately for, for your benefit and the benefit of your customers. So I'll kind of wrap it up there and, and kind of see what, what questions you have about, you know, this particular test or technology in general, any of those sort of things. We'd be happy with the, with the time we have left, to Michelle and I, to address any of those questions. Yes, sir. Uh, are the dairy breeds already testing for health traits and have they mastered some of that already? Yes. Uh, so, so there are... Uh, you know, dairy benefits, it's all about the data, right? The, the data recording. And one of the real advantages dairy has is through dairy herd improvement, they have electronic recording of, for example, mastitis. And so they have built a huge database of not just mastitis, I mean, displaced abomasum, stuff like that. I mean, they've got all that in electronic records. I, I wish every time you guys treated something for respiratory disease, it came in an electronic record into, into Angus Central. It doesn't. Maybe someday it will, uh, but they've really benefited from that. But they do have now uh, genetic predictions, for example, susceptibility of mastitis. Now, there are things happening. I don't know if, if this hit social media here, what came out of the Australian meetings. Uh, you know, the, the folks at, at, uh, at CMEX working with Guelph have, have this, this whole immunity project going on. And that is starting to, to really roll out. It's, it's the Immunity Plus concept in, in dairy bulls, and they're doing a little bit in beef bulls. Uh, but Canadian Angus, Australian Angus, CSIRO in Australia, uh, Genome Canada has made a big investment in, in this project. And we now have a, a project going forward. And Kajal probably can talk more about this than, than I can tell you in terms of what's happening up here on this. But 
Australia just launched a, 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 their first set of EPDs for immunity. Whoa, yeah, whoa. EPDs for immunity, think about that a little bit. That, you know, that, that is, that, that's a game changer. You know, in terms of in an environment where we get more and more challenged by consumers for some of the things we do relative to antibiotics and all those things, what would a bull with greater immunity that would transmit greater immunity to his steers, what would that be worth? I think it would be significant. And, and I think that those sort of things are, are very much possible. There's a number of those kind of initiatives going on uh, at a lot of different avenues. Not every one will pan out but it looks really promising. They have some encouraging data in Angus cattle in their, their young sire benchmarking program where they, sh they, they measure the cattle for immunity and they see a, a, a dramatic difference in death loss when those, when those wean calves hit commercial feed yards. And, and so those kind of things, that, that's, again, if you'd have told me in grad school that we were gonna have an, immuni an EPD for immunity someday, I'd have told you you were out of your mind. Um, and, and there are things that by the time I retire, there'll probably be things I'd think are crazy now. So it, it's, that's, that stuff is coming. Uh, but I think there's an opportunity again for, with, with, with data and testing and, and research that, that this cattle business is, is moving and, and there's an opportunity there I think for, for the adopters to really benefit from that. And, and groups like Canadian Angus that have the data sets and the pedigrees, those those, when they started making those herd books, they never dreamed that that's what they'd be used for, but they're really valuable assets that you have, and, and we're going to help you make the most of them. How are you tracking, like, can you get a really genetic outlier that says this bull is going to be all of a sudden number one in weaning, carcass data? How do you track that, that from the SNP to getting hard data to compare them? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a matter of this is a growth marker. There, are, this is a marbling marker. We, that's where we sort of started with all this, with genetic evaluation, is, is that we, it was all about trying to understand the effect of this one little piece on a trait. But what we find is there's not one or three th markers that influence growth or marbling or calving ease or docility, anything like that. It's hundreds, it's thousands, it's so many of them, and so, what we do with genomics is, is we refine that pedigree and we understand the relationship. You know, here's animals that on pedigree you would say they ought to share 25% of their genes in common, but they actually don't share that much. That they, through, through which sperm cell and which egg cell get, were effective through the generations, that relationship kind of comes and goes. Some are higher, some are lower. And there are some animals that you would say on pedigree are not related at all. But if you look at their DNA, they're actually quite close. They go back to common ancestors eventually, way off the paper, and through those pieces have been conserved. And so in that way, we can understand this young animal and how closely they are related to the data documented animals that, that have the progeny data to show that they're superior, how much of that do they really get? That's, that's really what this is doing, is, is bring, bringing sort of that thing through. And one of the things we're looking at now that's kind of one of the new sort of innovations in this research is, is, is take, a, take an old bull like, like Traveler 23-4. You know, it's, it's interesting to look at him, and, and I, of course, picked a black example. Sorry, that's my native tongue. Uh, there, I could uh, pick out, you know, uh, a number of different red bulls uh, to talk about as well. But anyway, that particular bull, as you follow him through, there are certain parts of his DNA that seem to carry on generation after generation after generation, and other parts that don't, because we've got him, we've got him sequenced, we, we know exactly what he was. And, and what that's saying is, you know, when we had those first traveler calves, some of them were really good and some of them weren't. We kept the good ones. And then we had the grandsons and granddaughters, some of them really good, some weren't, we kept them. That's what we do, that's what we always do. Some of those chunks kept hanging around. The best ones always had those chunks. And the really good ones had those chunks two or two times. And they had lots of those chunks. That, that's, that's DNA just gets passed down in chunks. And so understanding how what you folks have done through selection over generations and what's been conserved and what has been, I don't want to say discarded, but set aside 
because the animals that had those chunks, you didn't want. They weren't that good. That, that's really what this is doing, is understanding the, the, the makeup of the animals that, 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 that work versus the makeup of the animals that don't work, the ones that are high for something versus the ones that are low for something. But it's, it's not this one marker, it's thousands you know, that, that come into play. And we, we can visit more about that afterward if you like, but that's, that's probably the best I can do in three minutes. Another question? 